So hopefully uh, these three folks uh, know this area very well and uh, experts in it. And uh, will try to help us understand what fake news is and why it is. And, and um, from my perspective, you know, what it does to our democracy. <laughs> and then I will say a few words before we begin. This is, um, I was going to introduce you. Sure. Um, so I apologize. Uh, this is supposed to be four, as you can see, but today we are three as Ben Railton, the coordinator of American Studies, cannot join us today. So if you have any problems with today's presentation, please feel free to email him. Now then. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy Sunday to come visit us. Uh, it's a beautiful Indian summer day here in New England, and you could be outside at Fall Foliage, but instead you're doing something much more important. Um, and today's topic is all about this modern flashpoint of fake news. While it's a contemporary point of relevance, today's panel will give you some context as to the history and existing basis of fake news and influence as a global process of creation. Our panel today will highlight how news media have shifted and transformed, with multiple influencers affecting its growth into the modern era of 2017. We'll provide you with a history of how misinformation has affected the political spheres of various areas and nations, and explore how modern iterations of fake news are impacting us and creating what we call information echo chambers that function as distractions from actual news. Finally, we'll explore the role of libraries in fighting fake news and how you can become a better educated consumer of news and information. Your library serves as an important bastion of hope in the fight against false information. We hope that today's talk can better prepare you for how to think critically and engage correctly with misinformation in today's democracy. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Sean Good. So, how are you? I'm actually going to stay. I'll, I'll go over here. Mm -hmm. like yeah. So, let me, let me talk for a little bit about, about four things today, and um, and then we're gonna we're gonna move from myself to Kyle, I believe, next, and then we're gonna end with with Renee. Then was gonna be in between here, but I, I'm I'm gonna talk first of all a little bit about the history of newsprint in particular, and then media more broadly. Secondly. I will give you an example of, of fake news in early modern newsprint. And then I want to talk about the fracturing of the news media and, and use a, as a case point here uh, the, the case of France in the early modern era. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about the, the rise of political extremism and, and the confluence of political extremism with with the, the fracturing of the news media in particular. So, four topics. The first one is, is, is about the, the origins of newsprint. Newspapers are, are themselves a, a modern invention, and a really modern invention. They arose sometime in the early 17th century. The first of the, the newspapers, or what people think of as, as the first newspapers, is actually up on the screen in front of you here. This is the product of a printer by the name of Johann Carolus. It, it, it was titled the Relation à la Fürnehmen und Gedenkwürdigen Historien. So it's a, it, it was a, um, it was a, a series of stories, histories that were memorable and stood out. They weren't necessarily factual to begin with. Uh, they were just things that were memorable, right? This had originally been printed in 1605, and it was, it was serialized in 1609. And that is, in fact, the point of origin for newspapers, newsprint. They were serializations of pamphlets. So when you think of the modern newspaper as a, a periodical, if you will, its periodicity is usually daily, right? Although you can still find weeklies and monthlies in the form of magazines and such. So, Serialization began somewhere in the early 17th century. By the 1620s, there were lots of weeklies, in particular in Central Europe, so in Germany, in, in the Netherlands, or what will become the Netherlands. 
and then eventually in England, and finally uh, they moved southward to Italy and, and Spain. So by the middle of the 17th century, you have what looks like a fairly modern media, at least with some periodicity and, and new things being presented in each new issue. The first dailies didn't arise until the 18th century. And, and so let me say a word or two about news. The idea of news is, is just that. It is, it is the new. So the serialization of pamphlets was all about presenting new information to audiences. And really the purpose of this was to sell things. The purpose of, of a newspaper, in short, was to keep a printer in business and to keep people coming to the shop to, to buy his wares. So you can see this in, in any number of early titles, the Neue Tidigen. Uh, this, is a, this is one of the first Dutch serialized papers. It, it's the New Times. And, and all that it really is, again, is the is this serialization of earlier pamphlet literature. Papers, newspapers, were not produced by journalists, not until the early part of the 19th century. In fact, the idea of a journalist it isn't really solidified and formalized until somewhere in the late 19th, early 20th century, in particular in the Anglo-American world. Up and up all the way through the 18th century, papers were produced by printers. So it was printers who wrote the copy, who edited the copy. Many instances they even set their own type. So they were a, a one-man shop, if you will. And usually these, these were shops that were owned by men. There were very few instances of women who owned printing shops in either England or France, I'm not sure about Germany, but, but the corporations that managed these, these printing monopolies tended to keep women out of printing all the way through the 19th century. Papers were a very odd production. Uh, they, were, they were highly unoriginal. Printers would crib from each other. They would literally plagiarize each other. So a paper would be printed in, in German. It would end up on the shores of, say, England, and, and the printer there would translate the content and literally steal you know, 50, 75 percent of the content and reprint it as though it were his own news. So plagiarism was common in the, in the news media world all the way through the 18th century, if you, if you scroll down a bit. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is, is that news production it was, it was not a professional enterprise. Go forward one, there we go. Um, but it, it looks like what we think of as newsprint, what we think of as newspapers in the early modern era. So the language of, of early modern papers is the language that we use today. The, the Quran, for instance, as in the first paper in England, the current and general news, second to the next one. The mail and correspondence. We, we often talk about correspondence today. You see this on cable network news. Correspondence are, in the early modern world, people who literally write into a printer, and the printer just simply reproduces the written letter. And then the Gazette, right? From the earliest instances in, in France, in particular, the Gazette de France is a is a state-run newspaper that that persists all the way through the 19th century. It's actually one of the longest-lived newspapers in France. So the 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 the, the paper it is it, it looks modern, but in many respects, in the early modern era, all the way up to 1800, it's not modern. Um, and, and I, I think I want to emphasize this last point that's made by Jonathan Ladd here in particular. Right? The existence, he says, of an independent, powerful, widely respected news media establishment is an historical anomaly. What he means by that is, it's not really until the 20th century that you get a news media that we think of as having rigorous standards, uh, being evidence-based, and, and ultimately having kind of a, an ethics behind it that, that emphasizes right, the pursuit of and the printing of the truth. So that, that, that modern form of journalism, it's really a 20th century product. The topic of today is fake news. Uh, and, and what I want to suggest to you is that fakery has been a part of media production 
from the inception of printing, frank, frankly. But from the 17th century and certainly through the 18th century, fake news was, was really common, but, but not, um, but it didn't form, if you will, a, a very large percentage of the news. A lot of the news was strictly, strictly factual, right? Such and such a ship arrived at such and such a port, it brought the following individuals, it brought the following cargo. The fakery was there, and, and what I'm going to give you is one example of this. It's an example that I discovered when I was working on my second master's in, in history. And, and I got deep exposure both to pamphlet literature and to a, a host of newspapers. I looked at two newspapers in particular, or actually one newspaper and, and a, a monthly periodical, The two were the, the London Times and Gentleman's Magazine. Now, these were very long, but one at times all the way to the present. So this, this began in 1785 and is still currently in print. Gentleman's Magazine peters out sometime in the 1860s, I think. So these are very long-lived periodicals, and they have a, a lot of, of stature. The London Times less so. It was one of 13 papers that would have been produced at the time, and it was, it was one of the few dailies, so about a half a dozen dailies or so that are produced in the 1790s. And I was calling the paper looking for, for information about crime in particular. My, my current focus at, at the moment when I was in graduate school was on criminality. And what I stumbled across were these, these instances where someone whom the Times dubbed the monster was going around stabbing people. And it wasn't just people, it was, it was young women in particular. And the victims were, were often, say, the serving maids of individuals uh, who belonged to the nobility or sort of notable middle class individuals. Now, there's a fruiterer uh, whose daughter, Miss Bars, is one of the, one of the main victims. So this, this individual whom the paper dubbed the monster, uh, he, he was described in the Times, this is from the, the London Times, as tall, dressed in black, with a large nose, rather curved. I'm going to come back to that physical description here in just a minute. And what was, what was apparently happening is the gentleman would lure somebody to, to see a flower on his lapel, and he would sort of lean forward and stab the woman either in the face or even in the eye. Right? This, this reportedly happened repeatedly. And, and yet, um, the individual was never caught. That story begins in 1790, about April 1790, and lasts all the way through about November of 1792. So it lasts for a couple of years in the newspaper. Over and over again, this, this monster goes around stabbing individuals, and mostly young women. Early on, this next little quotation here is, is from May of 1790. Early on, the London Times sort of knew what was up. They admitted, quote, that the monster turns out in great measure to be a pickpocket fiction, quote unquote. The light fingered gentry, having lately, in order to facilitate their plans of plunder, procured various instruments for cutting the pockets of ladies concealed in sticks, nosegays, flowers, etc. They admit that it was a fiction right away, a month after they start reporting. And yet they keep reporting this. And the Gentleman's Magazine picks up on this as well, and they report it over and over and over again. And it's alarming, and it has fairly serious consequences if you could go one forward. So, so what do we have here? One more? <clears throat> what we have here is what the scholar Jennifer Davis calls a moral panic. But it was a moral panic that was derived from a completely fabricated quote unquote crime wave. Now this was reported as a crime wave. Serial crime that was, that was happening all across London and was resulting in some disfigurement and, and ultimately threats to the life of, of young women. The moral panic I think slices two ways. One, there, there was panic around young middle class or upper or lower class women being assaulted. And so there was this Behind a lot of this reporting was language around the defense of young women. And two, there was a, a, a moral panic around the, the so-called criminal class. Right? We'll go, go one more forward. The result of this was increased police surveillance, and in particular a focus on what, again, I'm going to dub a criminal class here. Come back to that in half a second. And then calls for new legislation in particular to, to not only increase police presence, but also to create new court systems. So there were really 
large consequences that flow from this incident. And remember, th this is entirely fake. None of this is, is true. And in 1792, the Times and the Gentleman's Magazine will admit that it's not true. One more folks. The suspicions here fell on groups, clusters of people. One, on criminal soldiers. Soldiers would have been uh, anxious making in 18th century England, and, and for the principal reason that they are often, if you will, foreign to the district where they are situated, and, and will um, often come from a very different class from these young ladies who are being attacked. Laborers come under suspicion as well, um, and there's no clear connection here to, to labor, but for some reason the papers focus over and over on layabout laborers. This is a direct quote from the London Times. And lastly, Jews come under suspicion. England, as, as France did in the late 18th century, early 19th century, had a deep and, and long-lasting tradition of anti-Semitism. The description that you see above, tall, dressed in black, with a large nose, rather curved, is something that gets repeated, and, and it, it plays a, a fairly large role in this moral panic. So there's, there's this outside sphere of, of Jews who often get presented in Europe as foreigners, even though they may be Englishmen, or in, in the case of France at the end of the 19th century, Dreyfus writes, uh, they, they, are, they are Frenchmen. So one, one more forward. So the question that, that I think we, we should ask ourselves and we should talk about as a group is, is what was the instance of this sort of fate? I, I found this thing, um, it, it also got found by, by this fellow, Jan uh, Bodesen. He's, um, he's actually a physician in, from the Netherlands. He wrote this, this little book about this very instance that I found. He published this, I think, in 2003 or so. So if you're interested in this particular moral panic, I, I haven't looked at this for a long time, but it, it's an engaging little read and, and it could be fun to examine this. But it's hard to know how, how frequently the news that's appearing in early modern news and even in early 19th century news is, is fake. So go forward one. What I've done here is I've interspersed some, some modern takes on, on the question of frequency. So what you're looking at here is very, very hard to see. Sorry about this. What you're looking at here are representations of real news in the green. The light green is on mobile devices, the dark green is on, on desktops, and then fake news, which is down below here. In the period from November of 2016 all the way until November of 2017. And what, what the Columbia Journalism Review revealed was that if you look at direct visits to to media sites, whether those sites are mainstream sites and, and authentic journalistic sites or fake news sites, it, it divides in this way. Fake news ends up being somewhat steady here, right, over this period of about a year or so. Authentic news seems to be read increasingly uh, over time. What this, this chart may not show is, is the instance of news as one might encounter it in social media. So I think we, we need to come back to this because social media has a particularly distorting effect on, on fake news that uh, it is probably unique here. So next, next slide. So I'm, I'm already over time. Let me be a little quicker. The fracturing of the media. Here, what I want to talk about is, is the case example of uh, France in the latter part of the 18th century. The media, the media goes through periods of consolidation and then fracturing into uh, a million little bits over and over. And, and in France, this happens in particular in this, in this one ten-year period between 1789 to about 1799-1800, right during the Revolutionary Era. Prior to this 10-year period, the news media had been a highly constrained and very small enterprise. So at no one point in time prior to 1789 had there been more than 48 papers in existence at one time. That's for the entire country of France. And France would have a population of about 30 million in 1788 and 1789. So very small enterprise. 
But what happens in, in, over time is there's, there's this rigorous censorship regime, they call it la censure préalable, uh, the censorship, it's, it's called prior censorship. So basically the state looks at every media production prior to its publication. That regime of censorship breaks down in the five or so years between 1783 and 1788. By 1788, censorship has almost entirely disappeared. There was a whole apparatus to, to censor news publications. Run by the state, uh, it had what was called a directeur de la librairie. It had uh, a book police, believe it or not. And then it even had spies, about 30 of these spies. These are fascinating reports to read if, if you ever get a chance. Um, the, the spies, they, uh, they called them les mouches, uh, the flies, because they operated like little flies on the wall. Right? That whole apparatus falls apart, and, and in the 10-year period between 1788, 89, and, and 1799, the press just goes bonkers. It, it flatters. So immediately, it doubles in size just around politics. So while there had only been about 48 papers in circulation at any one time, in 1789 alone, there are 107 newspapers that are devoted solely to politics. Right? So there's this explosion of, of press. And that persists all the way through this 10-year period. And the press fractures into a variety of perspectives. The language that we use around politics today, about the right and left, that is the product of, of the, uh, uh, the seating arrangement, believe it or not, in the Assemblée Nationale of, of the Paris Parliament. Those on the left have one political perspective, those on the right have another, and, and they jive with our own understandings of left and right from uh, more if you will, progressive views to the left and, and more conservative views to the right. All of that is an invention of the French Revolution. The diversity of the perspectives there, maybe you can cycle through, through one more. Um, the diversity of perspectives here is it's, it's really incredible. It's, it's something that France has never seen. So there's this explosion. And, and in particular in the number and varieties of paper, right? And, and it's a coincidence, uh, that's not the cool way I want to say that. It, it, there's a, there's a, how to, how to phrase this. Um, at the same time as political tumult increases, the number of papers increases, and, and the variety of papers increases. So, it's, it, with this comes a growing readership. Readership grows by, by leaps and bounds. There is a, a kind of basic literacy that really rises in France from this moment. This 10-year period gives birth to a, a majority of, of Frenchmen who now read. And journalists and, and printers, really, is what we're talking about here, can appeal to very, very narrow segmented audiences. So from this point forward, you, you, can, you can appeal to very conservative audiences, and, and within conservative audiences, there are narrow slices, right? Nice one. But these audiences, they don't, they don't function like bubbles, hermetically sealed jars. Right? So let me, let me go forward to the next full slide. When, when we talk about filter bubbles today, and I'm hopeful that we're going to come back to this in just a few minutes here, when we talk about filter bubbles, what we think of are people reading exclusively in almost hermetically sealed little silos, right? In the early modern world, things weren't so hermetically sealed, in large part because the printers stole from each other. They, they literally plagiarized their, their content from, from each other's papers. But in the 19th century, that, that becomes less and less the case. And when we go through this again in America in the early part of the 20th century, here I'm going to borrow a little bit of what Ben is going to do. We have a fracturing of American media in much the same way as in the Revolution. And, and around a lot of the same sort of political tumult, mostly about progressive politics in the United States. This chart, this, this graphic representation, shows you what a filter bubble, filter bubble world can look like. But I, I, I want to read it carefully and I, I want to introduce a little bit of skepticism about it. So what you see are a kind of separation of views. To the right in red is, is the more conservative reading base. To the left in blue is, is a more left-wing base. And somewhere in the center there, 
green, I think, represents the sort of middle point. It should be purple, should it? Um, and what you see are, are, are a representation of shares of media on Twitter. That is to say, people who post something on social media. And on the right, two sources predominate. One, Breitbart News is the real monster, and two, Fox News. On the left, it's a little more fractured, so there is some fracturing going on uh, within the left. So sh shares are principally around Huffington Post, New York Times, CNN, Politico, Washington Post. But you still see a, a, an incredible kind of consolidation there. So people are reading almost exclusively right and left, it seems, and within a very few sources, for sure. Uh, Pew Research Center has done something very similar here around cable news. You might have something to say about this in a little bit, where it shows that cable news consumption, those on the right, for instance, watch Fox and watch it almost exclusively. Okay. One more photo. Last thing I'm going to say is that it's about political extremism, and I've, I've gone way over. <laughs> it's always a danger. I'm going to use the case example of uh, France again. France uh, in, in the 1790s is host to a, a very extreme political environment. As the revolution goes awry between 1789 and 1792, it gets more and more radical. And the press it, it itself plays a role here. Radicalism is mostly during the revolution on, on the left. There are a few right-wing papers that espouse some very extremist views in the French Revolution, but by and large, it's, it's left-wing radicalism that drives extremism here, and, and that driving I'll come back to in just a minute. Papers like the L'Ami de Peuple, published by a man by the name of Jean-Paul Marat. Marat becomes famous in Jacques-Louis David's painting. You may recognize this painting. Marat himself is, is murdered partly because of the content that he is writing. Marat and, and papers like his fueled extremism by, um, by pointing to vague ends of the nation, and in particular to foreigners. There was this dreaded fear of the, the Comte d'Artois, who is the, the brother of Louis XVI, who had escaped France just over the border into Germany into a town called Koblenz. And from there, he was supposedly organizing a counter-revolution, and, and it actually has a real basis in fact. He was organizing a revolution, but he was terrible at it and never could have get it to, to come about. But it leads to a kind of fear of foreigners. So maybe we'll cycle down to the items down below and then I'll... Yeah. So let me, let me say a few things about political extremism and newsprint. Establishing a causal connection between newspapers, media, and extremism is really difficult. It's hard to know which fuels which. There's, there is an extreme political environment in, in France that goes awry very quickly, especially after the monarchy is overthrown in August of 1792. But that's not necessarily driven by the press. The causation may run the other way around. The extreme politics may, may fuel extremist press. Or it could be a kind of mutually reinforcing causal chain, a causal network. Okay? But what I would say is extremist politics in 1790s France are driven by an anti-foreigner bias. And I think this is something that, that we see today in particular in, in modern 21st century America. France, during the reign of terror for a short lived period in 1793-1794, goes through you know, mass political executions. Some 16,000 people are executed. Many of them are executed simply on the basis of a fear of there being either actual foreign agents or the, the assistance to foreign agents. So extremist politics are, are often, in this era, I think, as in our own era, driven by a fear of foreigners. The last one on this page. But, but I would say that, that because it's difficult to know about this causal relationship between journalists and, and political extremism, we ought to be cautious about saying what the effects of, of media on extremism are. Marat himself, sort of in a, in a reversal of that, 
ends up becoming the victim of uh, a woman by the name of Charlotte Corday who executes him in his own bathtub. This is he's, he's in his bathtub here. He had a skin disease that prevented him from uh, going out in public, and so he spent much of the day in his bathtub. She came to visit him and talk with him, and then at the last minute pulled out a kitchen knife which she bought the day before and, and killed him. So <laughs> rather not a cheerful thought. Uh, so next slide. So, last point on, on, on this business of uh, causation. Well, this chart shows you also from the Columbia Journalism Review is Google searches that uh, are done by any, anybody using Google. And what they show is that each time there's a terrorist attack in the last, whatever it would be, uh, this is this is principally around yeah, the last two years or so, one two years. What it shows is each time that there's a, a terrorist attack, there are accompanying extremist searches. So the idea that the media is driving extremism, again, it's something that I would, I would ask you to be cautious with. Uh, I, I know that we were going to have a few words by Ben Rebson, but I think I've done a little bit of what he was intending to do. I, I think that you covered it quite well, actually. So. Okay. So, I'm going to give just a little bit of some definitions that have come out whenever I've studied this. Uh, my research largely focuses on online communities and their rules, norms, and values, and how they come about. But one of the things that's important to know is that communities formed around news gathering and information often have to define what it is that they activate around. And so in this case, fake news and social media are intertwined in our modern setting because of the way that these communities come together. My colleague Dan Paul II at Oregon State University came up with these definitions. The first thing is that you should know is that these news stories that are considered fake news are all shared through social media platforms, whether it is through Facebook, Twitter, and especially YouTube now. It's important that we understand that that is the medium, the channel of communication where these are shared. Now, these are also untrue stories, which again, within what we've just seen within Dr. Goodlett's discussion of journalism, does not mean that that's not part and parcel of journalism in some ways. There are instances of falsehoods that are printed within certain journalistic outlets that we have to pay attention to. But it's also sensationalism that drives people to these sites and to these stories. We are storytelling creatures. The reason you're here today is because the stories around fake news and its importance are what drove you to these chairs to sit in this discussion. We're, we're attracted to stories. When I give this talk in a longer form discussion, the first thing that I show is a famous New York Post headline that features the greatest ad of all time, and it reads, Headless Body Found in Topless Bar. It was printed in New York Post in the 1970s, around the time of a extremely high crime rate in New York. And it's also uh, published and owned at the time by one Sir Richard Murdoch, who has gone on to become an influential uh, newsmaker. So this is where news takes us. There's some element of sexiness or some element of spurious content that's sometimes associated, but that's part of journalism. However, fake news on social media are produced by actors who are not mandated to do journalism. When I say actors, I'm not talking about uh, thespians. I'm talking about persons who are outside of the sphere of journalism that we think of. They're not certified to do journalism. They're not mandated to do it. They have no real press credentials. Oftentimes, they are simply persons putting text into a content management system and uploading it. They may not even be real, as we've seen with the rise of bots, particularly those around Twitter, which have often co-opted uh, discussions. Uh, my favorite bot that I've ever dealt with is a bot that takes any tweet of mine that uses the word hexagon and retweets it. So I've manipulated it in different ways to uh, try to talk about important issues by always just including the word hexagon. It doesn't like it, but it can't do it because it is a bot. One thing, though, that bot 
and any other person creating fake news headlines are paid by online ad networks. And I feel like this is the most important thing to discuss because fake news makes money. We wouldn't be here talking about this if there wasn't an economic incentive to create and spread misinformation. If we can go to the next slide. So what does fake news look like is a big question. We're going to show you necessarily what it looks like, but I want you to take some characteristics down from here. Number one is that it takes the appearance of a legitimate news site. The ease of creating content in the age of convergent digital media means that all of us in this room right now have access to tools where we can engage with storytelling. So if you're tweeting about this, or you're creating a Facebook post, it looks like every other Facebook post or tweet. That's because we have shared content management systems. That's created through intuitive formulaic design. News and websites often take this formulaic design too, to the point where you can now create what looks like web blogs or blogs, but in fact include all the elements of a digital news site. They have a headline, they have a header image, they have a short description or subhead, and they have a story. They would also have a byline of a person. Now news are also created solely for clicks or to make money. Um, the only way that we pay attention to news that is ongoing is if we continue to read news and exchange time or information for this. Online journalism makes its money through online advertising, which only remunerates the creator when somebody clicks on the story. And thus, clicks are important. However, we're dealing with an entire world of information that is out there. When my students are creating content, I tell them the truth. They are fighting against YouTube videos and more specifically cat videos. They have a long way to go before they get caught up. So the reality is, how do we get caught up? Well, I gave you the story, Headless Body and Topless Bar. That is one example of what we call hyperbolic sensationalistic content. It forces you to pay attention. And people who create fake news know this. They know that there are stories that we are drawn to that grab our attention, whether it's something that is an emotional, hot plate issue, whether it is something that derives from local political situations, it's really gravitating towards our emotions as opposed to our logical appeals. And it's often written like this, all capital letters, choppy sentences, questionable spelling. Again, <laughs> this hurt to type as a communication media department professor, but I want you to pay attention to the lack of editors as emblematic of actual fake news. Copy editors are meant to go in and pick up the mistakes, and uh, based on my experience, they do a fantastically good job when it comes to copy. So when you find fake news that's written like this, it should set off uh, cycles to you in your brain that says this is wrong. It also contains a disproportionate amount of false information, disproportionate being that there are times that in breaking news cycles, words like allegedly or reports are coming in, stay tuned for further information. These are placeholders in lieu of getting more information about a story from a mass shooting to a helicopter crash. And so these are routines and frames that are put up. However, fake news subverts these frames and routines to create and commit fraudulent information and passing it off as credible. These are almost wholly online and these are spread almost wholly through social media in our modern age. Now this does not cover everything. If we go to the next slide, one of the things we have to make sure of is that there is a fine line between journalism and fake news. Much discussion in the previous um, election cycle centered around political partisan bias. And I'm here to tell you that partisan bias is not indicative of falsity of information. Uh, whether you disagree with the conclusions of the analysis of facts due to one's partisan ideology or simply their analytical process, detects a partisan position in the writing of an article, or finds a newspaper that published something of questionable editorial value. Remember, 
Joseph McCarthy, the famed junior senator from Wisconsin, got his start by subverting the newspaper publishing process. If, journal if journalists could only publish once a day, he would release the names of noted communists ten minutes before the publishing deadline. That's not exactly a lot of time to get an investigation into a story. And so the thought of being, if we don't publish these names, our competitor will. And they will buy our competitor's paper as opposed to ours. So we'll print the names tomorrow, and then we'll print the retraction on page six the day after. That's questionable editorial value, but that's unfortunately how, up until Edward R. Murrow comes back in combat zone, McCarthy gets away with this. Now, this should also note that this protects satire and parody sites along with op-eds. I hope all of you are reading The Onion on a daily basis as a way of lightening your mood. Uh, that is famously fake news, but that's meant to be. So, publishing non-notable stories about um, midlife crises and uh, existential inua in the format of news is itself the humor. Andy Horowitz also writes the Horowitz Report in The New Yorker, and this is actually closer to the problem because since he uses the famous uh, New Yorker font and layout and headline, it looks like news. Oftentimes, I've been fooled by stories that he has published before, but an interesting chyron has emerged whenever this gets shared on social media. Now it features Horowitz's head when a story is published, and on the left of it, it says, real funny, which I agree. And on the right of it, it will say, not the news. So it's subverting and cutting off the humor because we have a problem. So if we go to the next slide. One of the things that is important to talk about here is that changes in media have led us to altering uh, fake news and discussion. Um, I want to give it just a headline that talks about these different presidents and the way that they use media related to their time to gain ascendancy in office or to change the way that we think of presidents communicating. So on the top left we have President Franklin Delano Roosevelt speaking into the microphones uh, used a lot of his fireside chats with the American people. Uh, cutting the past editorial red tape and subverting the need for a press conference, he can now be beamed directly into American homes, but only through his voice. Once we get to Massachusetts' uh, favorite son, who would have been 100 this year, John F. Kennedy, we then see the power of the visual component of a presidential pre um, presence through his telegenic presence. Kennedy ascends into the White House on the basis of his defeating Richard M. Nixon in the uh, first televised debates for the presidency. So it changes our visual expectations for the president, and it also allows him to be being directly smiling into American homes. Flash forward to 2008, and President Obama emerges because of the rise of social media, such as Facebook and Twitter, and the new ascendant channel of YouTube. Through YouTube, and it's access through your mobile smartphones, you can now get updates from the president speaking directly to you at any point. So if we go one step further, we have to know that Donald Trump is our first Twitter president. Donald Trump is largely seen as the first Twitter president because of that being his primary platform of communication. For those who don't know what Twitter is, Twitter is a social media platform largely set up around the concept of text messaging. Uh, it's the simplicity of message limited to 140 characters, although that is changing for specific users, uh, being up now to a whopping 280 characters for some. So we'll see what happens. Uh, he's currently reaching 39.9 million followers, um, and that's just on his Twitter account. It's by no means the biggest. Uh, Kate Perry reaches almost 100 million followers, so I feel like we should talk about that. But the connection that Trump has with other presidents is this direct connection with an audience. It goes directly from his fingers to our eyeballs. That is an indication of presidential power. The other thing that's interesting about Donald Trump is that limited ability is necessary for using Twitter. As such, you can take from that what you will, um, anybody can necessarily communicate on Twitter. 
without much need for access or utilization of the English language. But the simplicity of this means that he can be involved in a long-form conversation with anybody, 140 character message at a time. But what does he tweet? And that's what I want to talk about in the next slide. The first 100 days of any president's uh, reign or um, administration is that you have to focus on those 100 days as a sort of bellwether. So out of the first 100 days, he tweeted around 500 times. Out of those 500 times, he tweeted 30 instances of fake news and also 15 instances of the failing New York Times. If you go to the next slide, you see that this is what we call a word cloud. So, the word cloud indicates the frequency of the use of specific words. Now, 140 characters is not enough space to have longer form oratory uh, discussion. So we see frequent uh, repeating of words like great, big, jobs, media, American people, and then also Obamacare. Um, but the words fake and news occur very frequently, which indicates his use of this during his first 100 days. So you should pay attention to this because this is one of the reasons why we're talking about fake news is his use of it because we're focused on paying attention to it. And on the next slide, <coughs> it's important for us to talk about what gets called fake news. Now I apologize if it is difficult to see. We're about to go deep into a tweet, deeper than you probably felt comfortable doing 140 characters. So this comes from June 28, 2017, when the Washington Post publishes a story that he does not like. Uh, he writes the hashtag Washington, Amazon Washington Post, sometimes referred to as the guardian of Amazon, not paying internet taxes, which they should, is fake news. Now there's a lot to parse out from this tweet. Number one is that he's referring to Amazon and Washington Post being linked because Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, also owns the Washington Post. And so what he's saying is that the commercial interests may preempt the Washington Post's need for publishing uh, true media. Maybe some of you can also tell me what internet taxes are. Purchasing online. That, he, that sales tax, but what's an internet tax? Well, they don't exist. So, <laughs> so we just have to make sure that we pay attention to this right here, and then ties in with writing in fake news. Again, all caps, which should be a signifier of what's being said. Uh, we flash forward here. Uh, to June 12, 2017, he writes, Remember, when you hear the words sources say from the fake media, oftentimes those sources are made up and do not exist. So he's calling into question specific practices of journalism, such as anonymous sourcing, the type of sourcing that uh, the Watergate investigation led into the uh, deposing of President Nixon. Just also one thing, uh, almost five years to the day, he'd written an extremely credible source has called my office and told me that Barack Obama first get is a fraud. So, pointing out false um, sources or pointing out journalistic practices as a negative of fake media or biased media is one example of how our president uses fake news. And there's a longer form discussion that we can get into about it, but this is just one slice of a much bigger pie of discussion. So if we go to the next one. This is actual fake news. They're not different stories. I know I'm asking you this, but they're not. I'm just going to spoil that. There comes from two different sources. On the left, appropriately, we have Liberal Society writing a news story about Kelly and Conway being removed from the Sunday morning talk show circuit. It reads, White House finally gives Kelly and Conway the boot. Are you glad? White House just gave Conway the boot, prepared to be infuriated, reads a headline from Conservative 101. Now, there are two things that you should notice right here. The first is that it's priming you to feel a very specific emotion. Most news is written as a descriptive headline. It's meant to draw you in and make you pay attention. It's not meant to make you feel one way or the other. Um, if you're reading a news story that reads, Headless Body Found in the Topless Bar, Are You Glad? You should re-examine your choices for news. So, when you're reading this, you should also note that they are all tagged underneath news. That's because it's very specific metadata tagging. 
or information. It's more likely to be found within Google's search algorithm if it's tagged as news because it'll show up on search feeds and patterns. This is often how when stories about mass shootings break out, such as that in Las Vegas, uh, news stories that come from 4chan often get cycled to the top of the page during breaking and developing news. But if we go to the next page, <coughs> Something else that I've pointed out is that they're owned by the exact same Florida media company. Now, why would that be the case? Scene introduced a very specific point that I want to elaborate upon. The concept of filter bubbles. Let's say you vote one way or the other. You have specific uh, partisan beliefs or you have specific beliefs of anything. Perhaps you're a cat person, perhaps you're a dog person. You don't want to have any dog video show up in your cat feed. You can simply block all of your friends that have dogs. But guess what? Now you've created a bubble of which no dog stories can necessarily get in. Same goes vice versa. True for that. This is an example of using a filter bubble as a way of subverting sharing information. So if we go to the next slide, there are five different outlets which American News Limited Liability Corporation of Miami owns. Liberal Society, where the Conway story was more heavily shared on Facebook, Conservative 101, Democratic Review, which skews more liberal, American News, which skews more conservative, and God Day, which has a more religious focus. So here's the thing. It's not that it's not for us that there are so many choices that American News Limited Liability Corporation gives us. It's for them. By using filter bubbles and exploiting them, they publish the same story for different audiences. And because that same story is emotionally geared and drives us to click that, different audiences fall into the trap of clicking and sharing. The author for both stories is a pseudonym. They don't necessarily exist. It's one person taking a story and resharing it among these different sites. But this publisher receives all the ad revenue from the clicks. Now the other thing that we have to pay attention to is how confirmation bias works. You might have noticed that uh, it asks us whether we're happy or prepared to be infuriated. Confirmation bias is a, is a hypothesis that says that we encounter information on a daily basis that reinforces our paradigms of what is reality, what is true, what is real. So if Kelly and Conway leaving Sunday morning talk shows is going to make me angry, then it's going to write information that reinforces those worldviews. Confirmation bias also helps us create filter bubbles because if we encounter information that forces us into cognitive dissonance, we don't like that, so it is easier than ever on social media to block said information. Now, if we go to the next slide, we have to remember, Donald Trump sells papers and clicks. No person alive has been as famous as Donald Trump is in this moment. Alive. So, he's being uh, fought against by uh, Jesus Christ and possible other internet celebrities. But because everybody has an opinion on him, these opinions drive clicks. And because those opinions drive clicks, more stories are written about Donald Trump. Not just from legitimate news sites, but also from fake news sources. And more stories about Trump creates more money from clicks. So the truth about fake news in this situation is that we have a hunger for Trump stories the way that Trump has a hunger for steak that's cooked well done with a side of ketchup. So, fake news exists to fill a vacuum where real journalism can't function fast enough to fill in. Fake news stories exist to fill that vacuum where real journalism can't be produced quick enough. These sides of stories often prey on emotional issues and they exist and discuss conspiracy theories and stories. And so for us, going forward, one of the things that we have to do is engage in thoughtful information literacy, which I believe Renee is going to be doing in the final part of our panel. So I don't think I... Oh, yes. One last thing. The reason why you should be paying attention to what Renee has to say has everything to do with the real consequences of fake news. Fake news and the insertion of misinformation leads to a less informed populace by discussing fake issues. 
Now, one of the things that we've seen in the previous year's election was a, re was a rejection of existing gatekeepers, many of whom did not regard Donald Trump as a legitimate populist candidate until in any other uh, idiom he uh, emerged to the top of his party's uh, candidacy. We're also seeing this misinformation leading to very polarized debate. Because of misinformation, we can't necessarily engage in civil discourse ourselves. And there's less room for it when we're debating basic tenets of facts. This leads to a shaping of reality that does not necessarily agree with our it relies on objective reporting. In fact, it revolves around an emotional basis of reporting typified by historified news. And right now, we have a sort of murky political future because social media have contributed to this concept of fake news. Most of my students get their information sources from Facebook. Most of uh, the younger patrons at this library probably do too. The reality is, because we're used to getting information for free, some of us are getting what we pay for, and thus, we're running into problems where our political future can be potentially dictated by people who are not mandated to create journalism. So it's something that we have to pay attention to as Facebook and other sites re-examine the algorithms that are used to share said information. But I want to turn it over now to our librarian, Renee Frattantonio, who's going to talk more about this concept here. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, so glad that you came. So I know some of this, how many of you are actually using Facebook? Okay, so we've got like an even divide here. You might think that just because you're not using Twitter, you're not using Facebook, that this filter bubble that we're talking about doesn't apply to you. But part of the problem with personalization these days is that this extends to anything that you're using online. So when we go onto Google and we just search for the news, Google already knows enough about you, about the people around you and your community, to give you different results just based on those factors alone. So you might think that you're getting something that everybody else who's searching for the news on the current uh, mass shooting, for example, is getting, but you're not. You might be getting something that is tailored specifically to you, and that causes problems. We're not sharing a, uh, an accepted reality, as uh, Kyle just explained. We all see something that is slightly different that actually uh, conflicts or confirms certain biases we have. So, what do we do about it? Um, one of the things is coming here. So you came here today, you're learning about it. I have actually uh, been very deeply committed to this since uh, last year. I ended up putting together an entire guide for the Fishburg State students, but this is an accessible guide for everyone. It's open, it's on the internet, so I'm actually gonna flip things over for you. Uh, usually I have the podium right up there with me, so this will be a little interesting. So, right on, you can go into any browser that you are choosing to use. I'm going to get out of the PowerPoint one. Alright, so let's just show you how to get to this. If you are on Google, you, or you can probably do this on any search engine, if you type in fighting fake news, and Fitchburg, oops, we're getting a notification. Interesting. <laughs> Fitchburg State. <laughs> and it's going to be the first result, or at least it should be the first result, because I've given it a lot of information to find uh, this specific guide. You could also type in my name, it would probably come up as well. Um, so the first link is this guide that I've put together. And you may have noticed we have a number of posters all around today. We've got one of the scenes actually sitting right in front of it. Thank you for moving to the side. Uh, and it was on the door when we were walking in. So this is a really nice infographic that uh, the information, sorry, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions put together to help people actually get some good information on how to check the information to come across online. So one of the first things we need to do is to consider the 
source. And you guys have already heard about this quite a bit today, is that source is really important. Uh, when we look at information on websites, it can often look exactly like the news sources that we're familiar with, we're comfortable with. So click around, look at the source, um, actually read its mission, read about it. Um, let's see if I can pull up something. This is going to be one of those tests of Google. So Google on my computer knows quite a bit about me and I've searched for this article a lot. Um, fake professor, um, what else is it? Melissa Zendars. Yeah. Yes, yeah, this one right here. Fake professor calls free vegan fake news. So I like to show this to my students a lot. I actually got to hear Melissa talk at a conference of, back in January, and she put together this really nice list that a lot of fact checkers are using these days to get an idea of what sites out there exist that are not good sites, that are fake, that are misleading, and also which ones are, she gives you some of their political biases as well. So one of those sites was the uh, Free Beacon, and they took issue with being labeled as fake. Uh, so they wrote this nice article about her. It's very nice. I like it. It's called Fake Professor, called <laughs> Free Beacon Fake News. Um, I, I don't really know how you get to be a fake professor, <laughs> but <laughs> this, this is that ad hominem attack that you've probably heard of and you're familiar with. We, Trump does it quite a bit. It just calls people out for, you know, being dumb or stupid, and he's trying to uh, cut away their their credibility. So this is what this fake news site is actually doing. They're trying to cut her credibility in a way that makes you second guess her uh, authority to tell you whether or not the free beacon is fake news. So when you see a headline like that, I mean, you could click on it. Um, but remember, clicking on these sites is also going to give them money. So that's part of my problem with trying to teach this, is that I click on the site and every time I click on this article, it's giving the site some extra information about me and what my research interests are, but it's also giving them money. I hate that. <laughs> but I kind of need to do this so I can show people. So one of the things about this site is that it looks exactly like real news. Um, you can, any real news you find online. One of those things is they've got the byline. And this is one of the next things that we do. So we consider the source and then we read beyond that title. So we read the title and we're like, what is this? How do you be a fake professor? I'm not sure. So we click and we look around. So now we get to actually read the article itself. So we've got a byline, um, a little subheading, awful fake news list written by feminist and social justice activists. Uh, and then as we go beyond, fake professor, feminist and activist Melissa Mish Zendar has deemed the Washington Free Beacon fake news on a list that is now being distributed as a media guide by Harvard University. Zimdar, a Donald Trump critic and Carly Rae Jepsen fan. <laughs> what? what? Why is that there? I, I mean, I don't understand. Uh, so those are the kinds of things you might see in sources that are less than authentic and very questionable. This is a humorous one that I like to use for that reason. But after you have done a little reading and you've, you've noticed some things that are questionable, Take a look at the author. So we can click on Elizabeth Harrington and find out what other things Elizabeth has written about. Uh, typically, when you are looking at any credible news site, it's going to have all of the author's other works right there for you to see. And you get a good idea of what that author is writing about. Are they some kind of uh, news correspondent within a specific area? And we might notice a lot of time on these sites that there is no exact area that she specializes in. So we get all kinds of different things in here and some of it is going to frustrate you, like we said. 
fake news often tries to make you feel something. I mean, news in general is typically trying to get you involved and interested enough to take action, hopefully. But fake news particularly is trying to divide us in ways that uh, get them more clicks on their site. They don't really care about the, the issue at hand. Uh, but it's also going to create problems within us as a community. And we don't necessarily want to be pulled apart. So as we continue, it's really important to look for sources that are trying to give you the facts without uh, putting in information that upsets you in a way that makes you want to go to the person that you know you disagree <laughs> with and have an argument. Like that's not, that's not civil discourse. It's totally okay to have differing views, but we need to be able to talk about them in a productive and constructive way as opposed to just you know, calling someone fake or stupid. So take a look at what else the author has written and get an idea of whether or not this is something to actually continue supporting, you know? The next thing that is right here on the guide is supporting sources. And when I'm typically with students, we're talking about, oh, are there references? Is there a bibliography? Can you go and like follow up on that person's source? They don't do that in the news. We do not have a reference list at the end to go to. Instead, we have, thanks to the internet, links. So whenever you see one of these links, and these all appear in orange, so I hope everybody can see that. Um, anytime you see a link, this is supposed to actually bring you out to the source that is being mentioned. And I have noticed in many of these fake sites that the source that they send you out to doesn't necessarily support what they're saying it does, where the information is taken out of context. I've seen this and done this with students where uh, we pick apart a bright part of article about the gender wage gap and why women shouldn't make the same amount of money as men. And it's done deliberately to make you mad. Like, that is the way this is going to work. But when you click on all of those links, they all went to foreign sources. Some of them you couldn't read because they were not in English. And others were uh, just completely taken out of context. There's this like one piece of information that they took, and they used that as their basis for this source says, and it's actually not the case. This isn't something that only happens in fake news sites. So when you come across dead links in any type of source, I do uh, gender wage gap quite a bit with students because it's a good topic to get them started on something controversial. There's a good article from The Atlantic. Where, are we all familiar with The Atlantic? So we know that, for the most part, The Atlantic is a pretty credible, authoritative source of information. Their news site isn't always link-checked. So they link out to something that is supposed to actually support, uh, it's supposed to show you research when you click that link, and it's a dead link, it goes nowhere. So when you come across that, it's it makes you question. It's like, okay, well, where do I find this information that they're referring to? If I can't follow up on this information and this claim, then maybe I should move on. I should go to a different source. What? So, okay. yeah. Is that, is that just not maintaining the website? Yes, it is a fact. It's, it's not maintaining the website. I'll see if I can pull that up so you can see. Uh, so, once again, my computer knows things about me. So, gender, wage, gap. Uh, the Atlantic. Um, Facenet, I think it's this one. So you'll notice this is from 2013. And that's part of the problem. So when you come across sources, take a look at the date. A lot of the time, fake news will use old information and try and tout it as new information. And that's just not the way news works. You can't do that. So pay attention to the actual date of the information. So when I click on a new survey from PayScale this morning, I get this error. Sorry, but this page is not available. If I'm working with students and they're doing a controversial uh, topic for, for uh, a paper, for an essay, so they can use some uh, actual newspaper sources, I don't tell them to use this article. Let's go and find something that can actually provide us better information than linking us out to something we cannot necessarily find. Yeah, so we got an error instead of actually getting the study. 
I mean, there are ways to actually find the study, but it, it makes it harder for you. So you have to do more digging when you're trying to use sites that are not necessarily paying attention to their links and keeping things up to date. So it doesn't only happen on fake news. That's what I would like you to take away from that. This is a problem, and we just have to pay attention and try and look for better information. So when we go back to our nice little infographic, I just talked about checking the date. So there are sites out there that will take old news stories, put a new headline over them, and set it up there. And then people will be fooled and think that it's new information. And a lot of the time it has been either uh, we've moved on, new information has replaced it. That's typically how our information cycle works, right? As we learn more, the information we knew before might be replaced or um, corrected or added to. That's, that's how we, have, we want things ideally to work. So then we talked about checking uh, for the Borowitz Report and the Onion. They're really entertaining sources. They're, they're jokes though. Like, that's the point. They want to make you laugh. So look around. A lot of them, Borowitz Report is telling you right from the beginning it's not real anymore because people were not understanding that it was a joke. Um, but, but I'd like to point out that there is some other political humor out there. So how many of us watch late night? Late night shows at all? Some of them sometimes. There's a lot of political comedy going on. And it's entertaining and sometimes it like lightens the mood a little bit. And you're like, okay, I can laugh about that today. But other times it brings us down entirely. And you're like, ugh, I can't believe we're talking about this still. But that is often used in place of real news. People will uh, watch those shows to get their news. And that's not an ideal source because a lot of the time they're using uh, an actual story from the news, taking it slightly out of context in order to make fun of it. So fake news is really a horrible term. It covers way too many different things. So Kyle did a nice little talk where we broke down what we're talking about when we are saying fake news today. But I want you to keep in mind that fake news is just not a great way to describe this information because there are so many different things that can actually fall under fake news. Um, someone recently, yeah, well, so I went to URI, so I still get my um, URI alumni paper. And they sent it out to us, and one of the communications professors has identified six different types of fake news. So we have misinformation, disinformation, who thought those were different? <laughs> we have uh, propaganda, we have parody, and I'm forgetting, oh, there's just one that's I can't remember the last two. I'm sorry. I will have to brush up on that and let you know. But basically, we have all of these different things that can be called fake news. So when our president calls things fake news, it really undercuts the entire um, fake news spectrum. And it makes it really muddy. We can't figure out exactly what we're talking about when we use that term. So. Check to see if it's a joke. Check your own biases. That is really, really important. So I am not uh, afraid to say that I am biased. And I don't think anybody should be afraid to say that they're biased. But we do need to be careful when we are reading and sharing information, very specifically when it comes to sharing information. When we are reading information, we are actively seeking stories that uh, will inform us but a lot of the time we're looking for stories that we agree with. It's just how we don't necessarily want our opinions to be challenged. But sometimes that is the way it needs to be. You need to be challenged by the information you encounter. If not, then we're not actually changing and we're not learning more about an issue. So when we talked earlier about our political fracturing of the news media, we have Fox and Breitbart on one side of our conservative um, information spectrum, and then we have all of those other 
sources on the left, we have New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, um, MSNBC. MSNBC. So on the left, we have all of these different perspectives. And from one to the other, they might be slightly different. Most of the time, they're agreeing with each other. And then on the right, we have Fox News, which most people on the, the right are watching pretty much all the time. That is their source and main source of information. And then we have Breitbart, which is really muscling its way into uh, the day-to-day. -day. They would probably hate if I called them mainstream media, but they are becoming mainstream media at this point. This is where people are going for that type of information. If we are not all reading across that political spectrum, then we don't necessarily know what the other side is saying. And we can't necessarily refute things based on facts if you encounter someone who's telling you about an article they read and you're talking about an article you read at a completely different source. If we can't have a shared discourse because we can't agree on facts, that is going to only make things worse for us. So, yeah. How come you haven't mentioned PBS or NPR? Oh, I'm going to get there. Oh, thank you. Yes. I, so, NPR, we didn't talk about that, but I would love to because I love NPR. I listen to it every single day, sometimes too much. And PBS is also another source where we try to consider them um, public, so they are trying to cater to both sides um, and more centrist in their views. However, I wouldn't say that either of them is necessarily completely unbiased. I don't think that it is possible to be completely unbiased. We can try to be as objective as possible, but we are always going to bring something to the table that is informed by our own opinions and beliefs. So, uh, Kyle, you, you've worked with NPR before? Right, I've worked with NPR Could you talk about that? Yeah. So one of the things that happens in the production of any news is that um, you know you deal with uh, different sources, different personality types. Oftentimes, you're the one that has to choose what information gets shared with the general public. So you have to try to remain as objective as possible as per the Walter Lippmann guidelines of public opinion. But at the same time, it's impossible to always extricate yourself from specific biases. There are ways to even create a story, a story mind you, that sets up a sort of narrative that people can detect if they're consistent enough with their research into it. However, most times, NPR strives for a very straight centrist position, merely reporting the facts and allowing you to consider the information. Um, if I can also point out something else that NPR offers too, um, Renee has been <laughs> remiss because she's done such great work over here and also sharing the fact check uh, stuff, stories that she has. So we have a fact checking guide that comes from different sites such as politifactfactcheck.org, Washington Post Fact Checker, Snopes, and NPR. So there are different ways which news now works to also check itself in the process because when I worked in PR, the story that was being produced rested on a person's bias. That person's name would be tainted if they published false information. We threw a reporter out of the New Republic, uh, one Mr. Stephen Glass, for concocting false stories and information. Now we're not at that point yet where we're doing that for other actors or pundits, but the whole goal of NPR was to create a public source of information to allow for discourse. Thank you. So that is that is part of the problem. Basically, we've got different news media that we can choose to go to, and you might find that one is more reliable than the other. I, I don't encourage you to only listen or read one source. That I would like you to take that away today. Read across, read widely. One of the things that I really liked about the New York Times recently is that in response to this problem, they have been posting stories from the other side. So they take, um, a, they have a nice little uh, thing, I think it's done online, I'm not sure how they're doing it in their print form, but they will tell you where to go and they will give you a link to uh, some of the more conservative uh, commentary, National Review, um, 
even the Washington Post, sorry, not Washington Post, I misspoke, Wall Street Journal. Um, so they'll send you to other voices from a Republican conservative side. They will also send you to uh, voices that are on the more liberal, progressive side, in addition to their stories. And a lot of the time, those are stories that are in response to things that have happened in uh, the New York Times itself or so on. It's really a wonderful source that I definitely encourage you to do. Read widely, read broadly, uh, don't stay in one, otherwise you really stick yourself in that follow and you don't, you don't find other sources that can help inform your opinion about the world. So the last thing is to ask the experts. So you can always come to the library. Mm -hmm. Come to the library, talk to any librarian. We would be happy to help you out. Uh, you can always come to Pittsburgh State if you are not able to come to the Lunenburg Public Library. We, I love talking to people about this stuff. Um, and then, as Kyle pointed out, we have the fact-checking site. Uh, the funny thing about fact-checking is they found that people don't necessarily believe fact-checkers. <laughs> Isn't that just, it's just sad? <laughs> so even when you're confronted with information that actually disproves your opinion, we, we are so emotionally entangled with that opinion, we often push back and we don't want to accept something might be wrong or that we might be wrong. So definitely take a look at the fact checkers. I use them very frequently. I've also, because I didn't want to focus this entire guide on politics, I've included fact checkers for science and quote attribution. Quote attribution is huge right now. Uh, if you have come across any memes that have Benjamin Franklin on them, So I tried to put in as much information into this guide as possible to help you guys out, help everyone out, um, help myself out. This was definitely a journey to learn more about the issue and how I can teach it better. So that's all I've got for you. Uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to come speak with you today at the library. But we wanted to turn it over now to you for plenty of questions. Uh, you've got three uh Fresh-faced professors here. Who are only two fresh-faced professors in a very eager library over here that are willing to uh, engage with you. So please uh, feel free to ask away. Yeah. So um, my name is Charlotte Caldero, and um, this is I've, I've been around long enough to see a change, as have some of the other folks here, um, in how news is reported or what news is reported and of course also the increasing loss of different news outlets. Right. Um, so there are fewer, you know, uh, outlets with actual trained journalists and fewer trained journalists in those outlets <laughs> to cover news. Um, so one of the, the issues you didn't address maybe because it's technically not so much fake news as it is unheard news, unreported or underreported news. Um, and that's something that, that concerns me both as a citizen, but also very recently I am currently running for state senator. Um, and some outlets are doing their journalistic duty by getting the information on who the candidates are from sources like the Secretary of the Commonwealth, and some are just using press releases. Right. So I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thinking about that. And I'm, so there's there's a lot we're not hearing about, I guess, and, and what, what you think about that. I think one of the things that uh, you should, that would be helpful is also, uh, as you go forward with your campaign and your work, um, is to also be in concert with these different journalistic texts. Um, Dr. Zimdars and I went to the University of Iowa together. Uh, even though I was at the School of Journalism, she was in the uh, Communication Studies program. One of the things that tied together was this understanding of the making of news and narratives. And so authors like Gay Tuckman and Todd Gitlin became essential reading for understanding framing and routinization of news media 
which often involved uh, the very thing you're talking about, going to the Secretary of Commerce or um, going to specific government sources for direct information as opposed to reporting on, say, press releases and not following up information specifically. But you're right about newsrooms being a hurt, too. The reason I left NPR wasn't because I didn't enjoy it, it's because the affiliate shuttered and was merged into another one. And so I made a lateral move into social media and education. There are newsrooms that are hurting all across Massachusetts, and indeed all across uh, far poorer uh, states in the country. One of the things that I talk about at the end is not just going to libraries, but also asking citizens to pay for local journalism. I threw in a remark that says we're, you, we're getting what we pay for, which if we're accessing content only through online portals is often free. But the truth is, supporting local journalism means that we get more information on candidates such as yourself, and we also get news about our local community, and we support a shared guide to what's going on within our community. The beautiful part about social media is that it allows for disparate voices to be heard. One of the things that does happen though is that it does potentially create filter bubbles. By supporting local journalism, you directly infuse a source of revenue into a community that needs reporting on specific issues like that. It can also help fund reporters there too. Now we're also working on ways around this. Um, we're definitely increasing subscriptions on the national level. The New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Atlantic has not seen um, subscription numbers like this since September 11th. But if we re if we reinject some of that uh, investment into local then that works even better. And one of the things I would like to say is local papers are getting better about offering specific digital incentives. So I subscribe to the Worcester Telegram Gazette because I live there. When I uh, subscribe, I also get a free digital subscription to the Washington Post. So it's a way of getting more national and international focus along with my local focus there too. If there are other newspapers that are willing to offer that bundle in, that's one possible way of doing it. But that's a matter of economics here. I don't disagree with your position at all. Maybe just two words on, on the brief history of the decline of, of local news. A lot of this stemmed, I think, from the disruptive technology of the internet in particular with the, the onset of the 21st century, a lot of news outfits began offering their journalistic wares online and for free. And initially there was this burst of everybody rushing to, to put everything out onto the internet because everybody else was doing it, right? It was a kind of herd mentality. Very quickly a, a lot of news organizations realized that the, they, they couldn't continue to do this, so they would throw up paywalls, and, and this, this happened early on, 2004, 2005, you saw most of the major news media outlets throwing their content up behind a paywall. But at the same time, because of a loss of revenue, and in particular ad revenue, th think about just the devastating effect of like a Craigslist. Craigslist, you may not know, was, was far more disruptive than simply throwing content up for free onto the internet. Because Craigslist deprived newspapers, and in particular, local newspapers, regional newspapers, of crucial ad revenue. And as a result, those, those local papers had to consolidate. So they ended up getting bought up by larger organizations that would sometimes own 10, 20 of these. So if you, if you look at the local media market here in Massachusetts, you'll notice pretty quickly that a lot of the local papers are actually owned by a kind of overarching media organization. And, and all throughout this period, what was happening was they were cutting staff, and the staff that they were cutting were reporting staff, in particular, obviously, advertising staff as well. But, but that, that consolidation, it really happened mostly at the local level. So what Kyle just mentioned and what I had mentioned earlier on was that there, there are national organizations that have been thriving, and in particular in the last year or two. The New York Times is having all-time subscription records. Washington Post is, is doing very well profit-wise. 
But even they, when they shrank their their reporting outfits, they never they never built their pool of reporters back up. So as profits have rebounded here in some of these big organizations, the actual reporting staff remains this very small body of, of reporters. So you, you've got a couple of things at, at a minimum going on. One is, is the consolidation of local reporting. So it is not really local reporting. A lot of it is, is just one media organization repeating stories across many local papers. And then you've got the, the big national outfits that themselves have, o over time, done fairly well, but only after they, they really shrank as an organization, and particularly around the Great Recession, around 2008-2009. News media as a whole is, is, is under threat, and, and you, know, you can point to, to many things, but I do think the starting point of that threat for the 21st century was the, the advent of the Internet. Other questions? Yeah. What is the speed of communication kind of promoting the ability to cross-share and share? Uh, okay, I would love to turn over. Go ahead. Okay, shoot. Okay. I mean, I can talk after. But. Well, but here's the thing. Emotion is one of the things that drives communication on social media. It's why Donald Trump is a master communicator because he can, he's the Hemingway of Twitter. He said it himself as much. And one of the things that happens is he elucidates an entire argument and discussion within 140 characters and he touches on many things. It takes skill to make an entire nation angry five times a day on Twitter, okay? <laughs> And yet, that's one of the reactions that you get through social media, instant engagement platforms. I mention cat videos and dog videos all the time. Those are a very specific human response within us. And so online communication changed our very perception of what communication necessarily should be. It's why we moved from President Obama to President Trump in using YouTube videos in longer form, quick cut um, YouTube videos to immediate tweets that get at the heart of reactions to a discussion or reactions to news stories and how we necessarily engage with content. That's not going to shift at all. Um, one of the things that we're going to see, though, is an adoption of newer um, motion-based and VR-based uh, internet platforms very soon. Um, Facebook is in the process of changing how we engage with virtual reality. I'm not sure how many of you saw uh, Mark Zuckerberg's disastrous uh, demo of the virtual reality series. It, I will be happy to show it at the end of this year. It's, there are about three minutes of which you need to watch just to feel the air go out of the room. But one of the things that you need to pay attention to is how different platforms change the way that we engage with or think about content. Um, my students don't necessarily even enjoy typing anymore. They prefer to use emojis, uh, visual content, or even Snapchat as a way of getting uh, direct communication, but also news. Most of my students got their information and their reaction to the Las Vegas shooting not through traditional news sources, but through Snapchat and survivors posting videos of the shooting to that platform. So we're seeing a whole different engagement, too, in that regard. Now, I don't think it's... I'm not prepared to make any emotional statement about whether I think it's good or bad. What I do think is that it is a shift that we need to be paying attention to and discussing and teaching. So if you want to go to those classes and you feel like coming to Fitchburg State, I teach those courses, so feel free to come into there. I didn't want to end on a plug, but I guess I will. <laughs> so, uh, like we were, we were saying, it's like, the problem that we have with fake news, as opposed to that more historical perspective that Steve gave us earlier, is that we have social media. So we can share these things very easily. And studies have found that most of the time when fake news is shared, people have not actually clicked on it. They have read the headline, they agree with the headline, they share it. 
And that means that it reaches lots and lots of people without actually informing anyone. You're just getting a headline, something that upsets you, and you respond to it by sharing it with people and writing maybe a little bit more about it, like why you're angry that this is happening. Um, and as more and more people use social media as their main source of information, I mean, uh, up until last year, I was not a subscriber. <laughs> I'll admit it, I didn't subscribe, I didn't listen to the news, I mostly got my news through Facebook. That's just how it was. Um, and I always kind of felt a trust that the government would figure itself out. So I didn't feel like I needed to be civically engaged. Other studies have found that the more people actually read newspapers, the more civically engaged they are, which is good. That's good news. We want to be informed citizens. We want to actually affect change in our local communities. So having strong local newspapers is really important. Uh, but it starts with us actually subscribing. So until we subscribe and pay attention, I mean, even if you can't afford a subscription, the library has one, so you're in the right place. We try to provide you access to those sources so that you can be informed. Um, but yes, we have a very large problem with social media just spreading information very quickly and fast. Yeah. So maybe to hook kind of off of that question, I think historically speaking, we've expected news to do a couple of things at once. And it's simultaneously present information, but because of the speed with which we got it, there was also some analysis and unpacking for us. And I think now we're seeing that kind of split, just the kind of raw information is coming out, and the analysis isn't happening. And mm -hmm. even, I mean, young people don't understand the difference between an article that's presenting news and a pundit presenting a particular opinion or something from the opinion page. So I think as we come to understand how can we have disparate parts of our communities take on these different things and how we now interact with it differently? I mean, I just... I, no, I completely, I completely agree with that. So one of the things that I've noticed with students when I'm talking about different kinds of information is they have never really interacted with a newspaper itself. They don't have something that they flip through and understand like the front page as opposed to everything in the middle and the opinion editorial. Mm -hmm. To them it's just articles because that's how it's presented online. And unless you're savvy about reading information on those websites to tell yourself, oh this is in the op-ed section, then people just accept it as, oh that's the way it is. So we need to be much better consumers of information, which is information literacy. That's what I do. <laughs> and, and before we go to this, uh, you yeah. talk about the internet. Yes. They aren't the first ones that ever used uh, headlines uh, yeah. to influence people. Yep. The, the, the news media itself, for years, used slanted words in their in their headlines that people read and felt that. Uh, this whole thing is, is uh, negative towards one person or another. Yes. Way back when, when uh, during the Korean War, when uh, Truman re relieved MacArthur of his uh, post yes. in the Korea, all the newspapers said MacArthur is fired. That's a slanted word. That's a slanted word no matter how you figure it out. And that turned people off because a lot of people loved McCarthy and it became emotional to them to hear that. And th these things went way back, all the way through the, uh, even the, the newspapers, the regular newspapers. And a lot of people would just read the headlines and see MacArthur being fired, yep. and then they wouldn't read the rest of it. Well, so I, I think I'd agree, and, and this is the, the part that I, I've tried to inject into this conversation. 
the professional standards around journalism, the, the actual size of the newsroom itself, these are things that wax and wane, they come and they go. The, the consolidation of, of news media versus the fracturing of news media, I mean, there, this follows something of a pattern. In the early 20th century, American news media fractures into a, a, a really varied media environment. And, and it's then that you have the introduction of what comes to be called, for instance, yellow journalism, right? So the term yellow journalism is effectively um, conveying that, that journalism is infected by slander. And I think this is partly what you're referring to. The, that, that comes and it goes. And, and partly it is a response to a context, whether that's a political or, or cultural context, Sometimes it's, it's a response to the, the disruptive technologies that get introduced. In the early part of the 19th century, for instance, so back up uh, one, one century, 1820s, 1830s, you have the introduction of uh, a kind of mechanized press that replaces the old Gutenberg press. The Gutenberg press lasts all the way from its invention in 1453 all the way up through the, the 18th century. But when it's replaced by steam presses, that can, that can kick out with rapidity newsprint or, or you know, a, any printed materials, it changes entirely the media environment. It fractures the, the newsprint environment in particular, and, and as a result, it, it, it creates a disruptive moment, and it opens the doorway for things like yellow journalism, for slander, and for, for a decline in editorial and journalistic standards. And, and, and I think that that's what we're experiencing now. So if you, if you look at what's happened in the last 15 years, you've had the disruptive technology of the internet that really has sapped the economic underpinnings of journalism. And as a result, you've got all these people now competing for a very highly fractured, if we go back to that slide that I, that I put up there before, a highly fractured media environment where hundreds and hundreds of sources are all competing for your eyeballs and are, are competing at the end of the day, really, and this is what Dr. Moody was referring to, for your dollars, right? That, that simple click gives you a dollar. But it, 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 does, it does create a kind of environment in which standards go by the wayside, right? So I think that you can see that in part here. This, this shows, I, I think, two competing things. It, it shows, on the one hand, some consolidation, where a very few media sources predominate, right? But if you look behind, on the right, if you look behind Breitbart and Fox News, you've got literally hundreds and hundreds of media sources that are all interconnected, and that people are reading, at the same time that they're reading sites like Breitbart and Fox. And on the left, you've got the same sort of thing. You've, you've got a, a highly fractured media environment that can contribute to this breakdown in journalistic standards. Okay. Yeah, actually, I do have a question about this very slide, which um, you talked about the big circles and the smaller circles, but there's a whole cloud behind that. Right. And there are lines. Um, and so... It's a relational map, if you will. Right, so that's kind of my question. I mean, on the one hand, you're saying it's fractured, which means split apart, but what you're seeing is that all, if I'm interpreting this correctly, and that's, that's really my question, are all of those lines the, you know, the link and the share, and this was sourced from here, and that came from there? They are showing the connection between the various media outlets and, and the, the way that the readers themselves make a connection between the, the information that's being shared. So a person reading a given source is also reading another source that's connected by one of those lines there. So what you've got it is, in fact, some siloing of information, where you've got people going to one or two principal sources on the right and maybe half a dozen on the left and a couple in the middle. But then at the same time, they're also reading really broadly, and they're reading oftentimes across, across ideological lines. So what this chart actually ends up showing you is that the worry about filter bubbles may not be altogether uh, well placed. The, the so what's, what's the data specifically behind this? What is it that was captured? So I just wanted to clarify that given the title of this graph, yep. this isn't about reading. 
It's, it's about the way in which people encounter it. So they encounter it on Twitter, and it's about the sharing right. of that information on Twitter. So you, you're right. I mean, you've got you to take the data it, it itself here. And the data is what items are shared by individual users on Twitter, and then what's the relationship between that item and other items that that individual shares. Right? So that's the relational map here. But it implies a kind of readership and, and audience. It's part of it. Since you're in education, um, you're embarrassing here and you're children. Um, and if you're referencing oftentimes the money involved in the clip and, and the consumerism. And so the, the, the fear I have is that all of these children have their hands on technology that influences them from the time they're brand new. But that's entirely different from presses coming into adult hands and changes in technology. So it reaches so young. So I guess my question to you is, is that when do you implement this kind of education in curriculum? And okay. how do you help? That's a big problem. Right? Yeah. So a lot of uh, education at, at the, I would say, middle school level has started incorporating media literacy which has been shown to have positive effects on how students and uh, children specifically interact with the news and information that they come across in all sorts of mediums. Uh, because most of the time we are talking about the media, we're talking about images that children see uh, in the media, like a television show, like the Kardashians or something. Like, what does what does that relationship between viewership at a young age mean for um, my child as she grows up? How is she going to think about and view herself? But media literacy is starting to move more into the news literacy aspect of it, and. All of that is kind of where I come in at, for information literacy because both of those news literacy, media literacy fall under that much larger category of how, how do we interact and use information ethically, how do we understand information. Um, I, I would push for it in the curriculum, basically. So if you're involved in your school's education um, board and in um, why can't I think of the acronym right now for parents? What? PTA. PTA. Can you tell I'm not a parent? <laughs> so, yeah, PTA meetings. Ask for those types of things in the curriculum because they are really important, especially since students and children these days are encountering information in so many different places. Like, we've got Snapchat now. Um, I saw that that was now a thing where you could get your news directly through Snapchat, and I don't really know how I feel about that as a medium, but we all have our slight biases on how we want to consume information. Um, but as children move to more digital mediums for information, how does that change the way they understand it? So we really need to pay attention and um, really encourage that type of education as soon as it's reasonable. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Yes. I do not get any of my news online. Wow. <laughs> Good for you. But one thing that I'm finding um, slowly happening is, for example, your half hour of EDU, 20 minutes of it is, what is Donald Trump tweeting? Who is saying what? And I wonder, is that because there are fewer journalists and those are, you know, focusing mainly on Washington? Mm -hmm. Or is it because they think this is what people want to hear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The reality is there are fewer journalists, but we're also narrative creatures. Can you tell me what you what is the? Um, oh, let me back up a bit. In the 1980s, cable news networks emerged with the advent of cable television. And so CNN was founded on the idea that it was going to be 24-hour news delivered to you. You could get all your news and information in one 24-hour cycle, couldn't you? That's the theory right there. We have enough correspondents, we have enough people out there reporting on information. We're finally going to know more about the world. Can you tell me what the number one news story was of the 1990s when CNN really rose in popularity? It's not. It's nope. No. What's that? <laughs> it all starts with a white Bronco driving very, very slowly down that LA. Yes. 
That's not necessarily news. What happened with O.J. Simpson and Nicole Brown Simpson was a tragedy. But that's a story tragedy. And therefore, Donald Trump provides and feeds that story machine every day. And he fits within that sort of news routinization, the sort of chaos embedding with news. He's a constant source of news and information. That's why he got so much airtime as a candidate, was he was always happy to provide a friendly soundbite from his uh, beginning saying that Mexicans were criminals, drug dealers, and rapists, to uh, taking uh, the candidacy and saying that American carnage was everywhere and only I can fix it. So it's, he's a soundbite machine. But we in the news world love that, okay? We love that because he provides constant content to that too. And an ongoing story with different people who may fit with a hero and villain and fluctuating roles in there. And he's also polarizing. Everybody's paying attention, as we see in there. None of us should necessarily care what type of food he eats, and yet I can tell you exactly how he likes his steak and his <laughs> condiment preference over there. And it's not because I've looked it's it up. It's preference, too. <laughs> his, everything about him gets reported because of our captivation and our interest. And so I don't want to get into the chicken egg story. Did we create Donald Trump or did Donald Trump create us or however we go there? But what I do want to talk about is that if you want to find reporting on other sources, you may need to break away from uh, your television news sites and maybe find other print sources. If you're comfortable not being on the online realm, terrific. I don't want to push you into anything you don't want to do. But there are other ways to get news and information non-Trump related. It is very difficult, especially if you go online. But there are ways to do that. Well, and, and let me add to that. Because I think that there are really worrying trends in print journalism, in part because of the loss of the reporting staff. You can see this in, in major news outlets. Think about the Washington Post. I, I get a lot of my news from, from the Washington Post, and, and what I've noticed over the last two years in particular is the Post has a tendency to report either soundbite material or, or literally to recapitulate a series of tweets yep. as though it were news. And, and what, what goes by the wayside in that kind of environment is actual investigative journalism that, that relies upon investigative ethics, effectively. But the president has announced a policy change on Twitter. And, and, and this, is, this is the position, so what, what was said here is that the president himself is, is announcing policy change on Twitter. I'll give you one example of this. He announced, for instance, apparently, without his, his military even knowing it, that he was going to ban uh, new transgender um, military personnel, and then eventually, I think he even expanded that to say that, that to indicate that he was going to to expel transgender military personnel. So, so the president himself is creating an environment in which social media itself becomes part of the news generating cycle. So I, I, I agree with this. The, the <coughs> problem that I have with it as a student of news media for the past 25 years is, is that it, it exacerbates the already existing problem of, for instance, using press releases to report news. Press releases are manufactured frames that are intended to distort or shape the reality. Twitter is, is nothing, for this president at any rate, is nothing more than the same sort of thing. It, it is an attempt to shape the discussion to frame it so that it, it, what's being talked about is what he wants it to be talked about in, in the terms in which he wants it to be talked about. So when the news media ceases to do actual investigative journalism and simply repeats sound bites or press releases, the news media in effect abdicates all of its professional responsibilities that it spent the last 100 to about 150 years developing. And the Columbia Journalism Review regularly reports on it, what are the journalistic ethics of the field. 
those ethics are getting tossed out by major news media outlets. And I would point to the, the Washington Post actually as one of the chief offenders here. The New York Times has gone through periods in the last 20 years of more or less uh, solid reporting, but, but it hasn't gone the direction of the Washington Post. I'd say the same thing about, about the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal has, over the last 15 years, in particular under the influence of Rupert Murdoch, allowed its editorial page to affect the frame of the reporting that's, that's, uh, that exists in its own pages there, right? So that the editorial page, in effect, decides what stories get printed and what don't. That's a bit of a harsh statement. I, I do think of the Wall Street Journal as a fairly good outfit. But this effect is partly driven by speed, I, I think. But I also just think it has a lot to do with the lack of, of staff and, and a very, very competitive media environment in which you've got hundreds of sources all looking for your eyeballs at the same time. Yeah, um, to be hopeful, <laughs> there, one of the um, uh, things I've started doing to understand some of the critical issues that are going on um, in our world is reading books uh, that are by journalists who you know, they're they're at the New Yorker or they're at some other outlet. It seems like the New Yorker <coughs> has has a number of these folks who start off on a, a a story that is printed in their their newspaper or magazine, and then they expand that into a book. Um, so Gene Mayer's Dark Money is absolutely critical reading. I read it on audiobook. Um, through the library. Uh, same with uh, new, new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think in some ways some of the antidotes is maybe you don't need to pay attention to every kind of today's news or you know today's tweets that it actually might make sense to look at some of the key issues for you or you know what you see as as what are the, the major trends that you're either hopeful about or concerned about and do reading at, at the book level about these issues um, by people who are really delving in and have those journalistic ethics and, and that training to actually say these are a whole lot of sources that you know bolster this idea that dark money is has completely captured our political system. So I'm of two minds about this. Number one is I think that you're correct in that longer form compendiums often provide important analysis into issues. Uh, my favorite journalistic book of the past 15 years has been Dave Cullen's work on Columbine, which is an incredible text that I recommend anybody read. Cullen's uh, work says that the narrative around Columbine was decided within 10 minutes of the shooting being set out, which ties in with what T Tuckman talks about, which is routinizing a chaotic story, which is a school sh a mass shooting at a high school. That's chaotic, and that creates a lot of doubt and unrest in our world. Cullen says that it happened that way because it was easier to then write the rest of the story. Not because we didn't have enough of the facts, but because the story itself was easier to play out. These were kids. Kids don't do this. So there must have been some corrupting other influence. And so we settled on Marilyn Manson and violent video games and black trench coats. You flash forward 10 years to when Cullen publishes the work, and in it, a psychologist says, Eric Harris had all the makings of a sociopath. And if you look at his brain tissue and if you looked at the actual interactions that he had, it says everything to do with a stronger personality bringing a weaker personality like Dylan Klebold into this story, in this narrative. And it's actually a tragedy of a best friend who turned his friend into a complicit in this poor crime. That narrative never gets talked about. We're still talking about the Manson uh, video game music movement today with that. And so I believe in that. But at the same time, 
In modern society, if you divorce yourself from social media, you divorce yourself in some way from an important part of our cultural milieu. I mean, even the president himself is on Twitter, and much as it pains me to have to read his tweets every day, it is important because he is our he is our president. And so these are official policy documents that are coming out. What I think is happening is actually it's a collection of different reactions that people are putting together too. That uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, for example, Between the World and Me, uh, that's coming from all his work on the Atlantic and then compiled together into a thoughtful narrative. It's just something that's happening over time. What's exciting is to watch that take place in real time through social media sources and sites. So I can't say that we need to divorce ourselves entirely from here, but I do actually want to tie into one thing that I wanted to say, and I hope that you're getting me on camera for that. Um, the one thing that I really love about giving this talk in libraries is that libraries are great for a multitude of reasons, but the main thing I love about them is that they're quiet. It, they should be quiet, okay? And here's why. When you're engaged in discussion, sometimes you're going to come across things that make you heated, very violent. Well, online you can type and yell, and nobody hears you necessarily. But in a crowded library, you all of a sudden don't want to hear me yell something across the hallway or anything. Fake news. Right, just scream fake news at that time. <laughs> Instead, it lowers my, uh, it calms me down to see this, and then engage in rhetoric and debate. So that's where the library becomes a great source of fighting against fake news and information literacy. is just a very atmosphere and environment. So I would encourage people to go fight fake news by encountering news at the library and then engaging with experts in discussion of this, as opposed to tweeting first and then Googling later. Any <laughs> last questions? Great, thank you very, very, very much.